God's new gift. Do you like to receive gifts? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't turn on the other mic. They just can't out wait for Christmas to come around. Or they can't wait for uh, the birthdays to come. And it uh, seems like it just takes forever for Christmas to get here whenever you're a child. But you know, whenever you get older, at other times, you really enjoy watching others open gifts. And you like to be able to give some things. And so God loves to give us gifts. And it's not really a new gift I'm going to talk about here, but it's a new expression of a gift that God gives to us. And it's found over in Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. And uh, so we think about this. We're going to think about some of the history of the world. I'm going to give you a two-fisted view of history of the world. It's one thing that keeps the Old Testament in perspective for me. And then we're going to think about the first half of the Bible. And then we're going to think, think about the second half of the Bible. And the Lord is going to guide us down those paths. So those four lines down at the bottom of the bulletin will kind of help you see as we're progressing along these lines of thought. But here in Jeremiah, Chapter 31, at verse 3, we read this. The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting kindness. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. It's God's loving kindness. It was God's goodness. It was God's loving kindness that protected Brother Randy whenever he was driving down the road and the rock was hurtling toward him. And thank God for that. But you know, there are times in our lives that God comes and he wants to draw us to himself. And all different kinds of things can come and draw us to him. Sometimes it's something that's not particularly good. Oh, I'm sorry, Brother Doug, were we, is there two specials today or just the one? Okay. All right. I just looked out there and I thought, oh, did I miss something? <laughs> okay. Very good. So God's loving kindness, his goodness to us. You know, it's really good whenever God doesn't have to get our attention. There were two farmers and one of them, both of them had mules. And uh, one of them said, well, how do you get your mule to do what you want him to and he said, you have to be kind to him. Well, it came time for them to go. And the one that said you need to be kind to him climbed up in his wagon. And he said, get up, mule. And the mule didn't move. So he just put his reins down and went to the back of the wagon and pulled out a tube before, walked around the front and whacked him right between the eyes. And the other man said, I thought you said you had to be gentle to him. He said, yeah, but you got to get his attention first. You know, sometimes it is bad things that come our way that get our attention. But there is another verse of Scripture that is a wonderful verse of Scripture that says, the goodness of God leads you to repentance. God's loving kindness, sometimes God in his goodness just draws you toward him. And so we need to be drawn in that. And so we think about the loving kindness of God. And uh, whenever we're going along and, and we're headed toward destruction, God has provided a way for us to escape. And it is through his loving kindness that he has provided that. Well, the Bible is divided into two parts. Now, there are more books in one part than the other part. 
which is the Old Testament. You have the 39 books of the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament. But as far as history goes, it's kind of a dividing right there between the New Testament and the Old Testament, a new thing that is coming our way. And there's another term other than the word testament. Sometimes it's referred to as the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And both of those things are mentioned here in Jeremiah chapter 31. So first of all, thinking about the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, my two-fisted view of history, which really helps me, and I hope it will help you if you get it in your mind as you are thinking about the Bible and trying to put things in perspective. Now, we all know that God created the heavens and the earth, and uh, God created man, God created animals, he created all kinds of things. One time, there was a group of scientists that said they had discovered the secrets, and they had discovered that they were going to be able to make a man. No, their names were not Frankenstein. And they said, God, we will show you what we have figured out. And the Lord said, this is not a true story. You'll figure it out. God said, okay. And so they said, well, let's see who can create a person first. And the Lord said, okay, you go first. They're out in the middle of the field. They reached down to get some dirt. And the voice said, oh, no, get your own dirt. God created everything. We know that God created the heavens and the earth. He created us. If you've been to Sunday school in your lifetime, you've heard many stories. Many of those stories come from Genesis. Some of them come from Exodus. And then the rest of the stories come from the New Testament, it seems like. You get a few of the prophets along the way in there, stories of David and things like that. So we have that. We have the Old Testament. And it came to a point to where uh, the people were going to a place called the Promised Land. And they sent some spies in, and the spies came back, and ten of them gave a bad report, and two were good. And the people did not listen to the good reports. And because of that, they spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness. Then finally, they got to go in the promised land. And they started living and worshiping God. And God had set up a system of worship for them, which provided animal sacrifices. And we know now, because of the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, tells us that the blood of bulls and goats does not take away sin. But they did that faithfully. That was their worship because it was symbolic of something else. It was symbolic of that which was to come. Symbolic of the fact that Jesus, the Messiah, was going to come someday and be their great deliverer. Well, you're going in the Old Testament for a while there, then you have the people. They fall into sin. After they fall into sin, judgment comes upon them. Then they begin to cry out to God, and God comes and gives them a deliverer. They call him a judge, but their judgeship was more of a military deliverer. And you have the series of judges. And then you have the book of Joshua. And then you have where the people want a king. Now here's where the two-fisted view <laughs> comes in. The people desire a king and it is like this that you have two fists you can join them together and clasp them together and you have a united clasping of the two fists right so what you had was you had king saul was a king of all of them united together and then king david came, and there's a little division there for a while, and then they were all united together. It was called the United Kingdom. Then Solomon, his son, was born, and they were still all united together. 
Then after Solomon's lifetime, his son Rehoboam took the throne. And the people came to Rehoboam and said, your father started getting pretty hard upon us in, in, toward the end of his life. So we have a request for you. And they came and they brought their request to make their life easier. Well, King Rehoboam went to the advisors that Solomon had and asked them, what do you think we should do? And those advisors said, well, actually, the people have a point. Things were getting more repressive and hard toward the end of your father's reign. And we advise you to listen to them and make it easier upon them. And if you do that, they will love you forever. But Rehoboam, though he heard that advice, decided he would get some other advisors. And so the new advisors came and they said, well, it's like this. If you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. Tell them that you can't imagine what it would be like. If you thought my father was hard, you can't imagine what it would be like to cross me. And he gave them three days to think about it. And they came back, and so you had no longer a united kingdom. All those in the north, the ten tribes of the north, they banded together, and they retained the name Israel. And down at the bottom, then you had the nation of Judah, and you had the divided kingdom. And as you're progressing through the New Testament, you'll find that all the kings in the north were bad kings. They were evil kings. And whenever they did that, the uh, people did not rejoice. The Bible says when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the evil are in authority, the people mourn. And so you had that happening throughout that whole time. They went into idolatry. Uh, they weren't worshiping God as they should. And prophets came along and kept warning them, if you don't repent, if you don't come back to God, then you are going to be captured and you're going to be taken off into slavery. So you had Israel, and then you had the southern kingdom, and it went by the name of Judah, which was the larger of the two tribes that were left. Israel and Judah, the divided kingdom. Now, off over here to your right, you have an area where present-day Iraq and things like that on the map, if you were to look at it, are over here. But in those days, up in the north, there was a nation that was called Assyria, and they were getting stronger and stronger and conquering many cities and many countries, and they were becoming the major world power. Now, down below that, in the south, there was one that was called Babylon, and they started getting stronger too. But coming back over here, the ten tribes in the north they were continually evil. And finally, what the prophets had prophesied about came about. The northern kingdom of, or of Assyria came over and got the northern kingdom, Israel, and took them captive. They became slaves again. Well, you had Judah had some good kings. There is some hope. But the prophets came and said, Listen, people, you need to repent. You need to come back. You need to get serious about serving God because if you don't, then the same thing is going to happen to you. Well, that was happening. Babylon got stronger and stronger, and it became the world power, and Judah did not repent, and they came over and they got them, and they were taken captive. So that's where you are in the prophets. They're either saying it's going to happen or it's already happened. And Jeremiah is trying to bring some hope here, though. He's saying, though you are going to go into captivity and though you want to be free, and we're celebrating freedom today. We're celebrating freedom in our nation. Thank God for that. 
Someone said all it takes for us to lose that freedom is for good people to do nothing. So we need to be vigilant and we need to be in prayer. We got, we got an example of that. In 1973, we were kind of asleep. There was a Supreme Court ruling that came and manufactured a so-called right to abortion in the Constitution. And we're kind of asleep. And those of us that they said it was in the 14th Amendment, you can go read the 14th Amendment. Where does it mention about that anywhere? I challenge you to do that. But we were asleep. We had some that we, we tried to stop it. We tried to peacefully protest against it and all of that. But we had for 50 years that wrong ruling that was reversed here in our lifetime, in our last few years, that again, but we were asleep. All it takes is for good people to do nothing or for good people to be asleep. Well, that's aside from all of this. Jeremiah is saying to the people, you're in captivity. I have good news. You're going to be able to come back. You're going to be able to come back into your land. And then you read in the Old Testament, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, where they really did get to come home and they rebuilt the walls of the city and they rebuilt the temple and they did get to come back. Now, how does that work for all of us? Well, there's good news if you have strayed from God. If you're willing to repent of your sins, then there is hope that you can be restored. There's hope that you can come back. There's hope that you can return. And Jeremiah was prophesying that was going to happen. They were going to get to come back. Well, so we mentioned the Old Testament. And then, in the fullness of time, God decides to do something new. <laughs> God sent his son. We celebrated at Christmas. He sent his son to earth. And whenever Jesus was born, you know, the wise men came and they talked to King Herod. And Herod said, well, uh, you know, when is this child going to be? And he was so ruthless. He wanted to kill the child who was the Messiah, the one that the nation had been looking for for generation after generation. But he wanted to kill him so that he could retain his power how wicked he was. And so he declared that all the boys under two years old would be killed. Since I got off on the abortion kick here just a moment ago, we talked about what a wonderful place we are. I went to a, a meeting in Atlanta several years ago, and this was in the wintertime. And the speaker, the preacher, was from Cleveland, Ohio. And so they were kind of teasing him about how cold it was where he was from. And it was a beautiful day there, that winter day, there down in Atlanta. And uh, so he kind of went along with them a little bit and talked about how nice the weather was and stuff. And, and uh, they were kind of being lifted up in pride a little bit about their city and all of that. And he said, here's your newspaper. I opened it up this morning. I read in here this morning 37 places where abortions can take place. You say you have a beautiful city. Well, I say you have a wicked city. <laughs> he turned it right around and he got off on it again. I did hear in just a moment. But you have an opportunity for a pro-life thing coming up on July 4th. <laughs> if you would like to uh, be involved in that, talk to Sarah afterwards. They wanted to kill the boys under two years old. And you remember that Joseph and Mary were warned of that, and they took Jesus away, and he escaped. Well, in the New Testament, when that's happening, there's a verse from the Old Testament that is quoted, and it is verse 15 from this chapter, the New Testament reference, that says, Thus says the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, 
refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. I think as Jeremiah was writing this, he probably wondered about that verse when he was reading it. He's trying to encourage the tribe of Ephraim here uh, that, uh, you know, that they can be restored, like all of the tribes can be restored. They're going to be able to come back. But right in the middle of it, though, it says this, a voice was heard in Ramah, a lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel, weeping for her children, the Jewish people weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Well, those baby boys' lives were taken. And then in verse 16, it says, Refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope in your future, says the Lord, that your children shall come back to their own border. Now, granted, there in the New Testament, when those baby boys were killed, we believe, though, that they went on, that God took care of them, and that those mothers at one point will be reunited with their children. At least those mothers who knew the Lord would do that. So you have the New Testament reference. And then we're coming in to the New Covenant. And it's down in verse 31 of this chapter. It starts there. And uh, verse 33 actually zeroes in on it. I'm going to read around verse 33 a little bit, starting in verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. So you had the old covenant, and in the old covenant they were looking forward to the time that the Messiah was going to come. They were looking forward to the time that Jesus was going to come on the scene. It's kind of like where this pew is right here. All of this represents the Old Testament. And then you have Jesus come. He is born. He lives a sinless life. He is crucified by sinful men. He doesn't have his life taken from him he lays it down of himself. And God raised him from the dead, victorious over that. And so we're ushered into the new area, the New Testament, the new covenant that God gives. Now, as we're thinking about the new covenant and the old covenant, you had the law, you had the Ten Commandments, you have the exact expression of the Ten Commandments. But do you know that sometimes you can be so strict on the outward appearance of something, you miss the real meaning that's underneath it? Sometimes you can do that. But in the Old Testament, they obeyed God. And the very best way to show you believe is to obey. Song says O-B-E-D-I-E-N-C-E. -E -E. Obedience is the very best way to show you believed. Well, I believe that salvation has been the same whenever God the Father and God the Son and the Holy Spirit, way back in eternity past, looked and said, we're going to create human beings. 
We're going to create them with the capacity to freely love us. And the flip side of that is that they can reject us too. And they say, well, what will you do if they choose wrongly? Because the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. And the problem with that wage of sin, where we have sinned, where we have cho chosen wrongly, is that we deserve death. And in eternity past, the Father and the Son, they said, we will provide a way. And that's what Jesus did. He provided a way. He died on the cross. His death was an infinite death. It was such that it could cover the sins of all mankind. And so you have the new covenant that comes along. Still in the Old Testament, you were saved by grace through faith, but they were looking ahead until Jesus was going to come. Now in the New Testament age, we look back because it happened as a fact of history. And whenever you decide to become a Christian, you believe those facts. You believe that Jesus died. You believe that he truly died. You don't believe that he was just asleep. You don't believe that they hid him somewhere. You believe, no, he died. And he was placed in a tomb. And then after three days, they started coming. The women came and they were going to anoint him for his burial. And as they came, they said, well, who will roll the stone away? Well, they didn't have to worry about it. After they got there, the stone was already rolled away and the tomb was empty. And they went back and told some of the disciples. And you had Peter and John, they were first. And they were running along there. And John was faster, but he got to the tomb and he stopped and he looked in and he saw it was empty. And he saw the grave clothes laying there. And this is a little interesting side note, how that Jesus took the cloth that covered his head and folded it up and put it down there. But Peter came on up and caught up, and he's impetuous, Peter, you know, and he ran right on in. And he's not here. He's not there. And so they go back, and the disciples are now meeting together. They've been locked away in hiding, fearing for their own lives, and fearing death and all of that. And Jesus appears to them. And Thomas missed church that day. <laughs> and during the week they came to Thomas and said, The Lord appeared to us. He's alive. And Thomas said, I don't know about you folks. <laughs> Here he said, You know, I'll not believe it until I can put my finger in the prints that are in his hands. And so he showed up at church and Jesus appeared again. But Thomas, all he had to do was look. And I think maybe Jesus insisted that he feel it. But Thomas fell down and said, My Lord and my God. They saw him. He was alive. There were witnesses. They knew him best. They had walked with him for three years, walked with him, talked with him. They had lodged together. They had done all of this. They knew it was him. They knew things that there were only things that they could know that were proof that it was indeed Jesus who was alive again. And another proof that they really believed that was that they themselves were no longer afraid. Oh, they went out and they would get arrested for preaching about Jesus. They would be thrown into prison, but they didn't care. They went on. Paul had been beaten and taken outside the city and left for dead. And what did he do as soon as they were mistaken about him being dead? <laughs> he got up and he went back and he began to proclaim the name of Jesus again. You know, every, almost every one of those uh, disciples gave their lives for Christ. One time there was an old time preacher that came to town and he was preaching about the evils of certain drugs <laughs> that provided money for many people that were in the town. And some of the people came together and they captured him and they took him outside of town. And they said, we want you to quit preaching against our business. <laughs> and they pulled a gun on him. And he said, you can't scare me with heaven. 
Well, what gives you that kind of boldness? I mean, we don't have that within ourselves. But it is because God is real. God is alive. He really is alive. And it's the Holy Spirit that comes into our hearts and lives. And whenever we have that need, and we're still kind of fearful in ourselves right now, but if we rely upon God, He is very, very powerful. And about in the first century, you had people that were preaching in the name of Christ. And there would be those that were against Christianity and they would come and get them and say, you are going to be burned at the stake. Well, one of those men uh, had the date set whenever it's going to be time for him to be executed. And the night before it happened, he thought, I don't know if I can stand it. I don't know if I will be able to take it with those fires coming up all around me. And he had a candle there in his room. And he thought, maybe, maybe I'll be able to do it. And he put his hand over the flame of that candle. Ah! He pulled it back. He couldn't stand it right then. But the testimony is the next day, they had him tied to the stake. And they had the wood laid all around. And they lit it. And the fire came up, and this time he didn't go, ah! He started singing the praises of God. Because that is the Holy Spirit that can come and give us grace to help in time of need. He's real. He's alive. Do you know him? Is he your Savior? <laughs> if you don't know him, I would invite you to come to this altar and call upon him. Because the Bible says that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And if you believe all of that, then you can come. You are very, very close to salvation. And then also it tells us that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you ever really done that in your life? Has there been a time in your life whenever you, believing in Christ, have come and called upon the Lord and asked Him to save you?